campers. Welcome hey. to my new session. That's right. Good afternoon. Sorry, we're starting up a couple minutes late here today. Uh, today's kind of a tight turnaround from another broadcast that I do just before this, but we got it all sorted out. Thank you for your patience. And we look forward to more Hobbit discussion today. So I'll pass things off right away to Ms. Binkley, but I'll be back uh, again a little early uh, today to, do, uh, to talk about some of your earlier questions and do some more Q&A with you guys. See you guys later. Okay, campers, we're going to start class today just a little bit differently. Um, I had some questions right at the end of the class that I didn't have time to answer about elves. And so we're going to take a look at something right directly out of Tolkien's book. The, one of the questions was, did the Noldor, who were a type of high elf, just one group of elves, did they have anything to do with the Sylvan elves, who are the elves that live in the woods? And what I would really like for you to focus on is this particular book. It's interesting to talk and discuss and think about all the things that Tolkien wrote and all the different ways he wrote things. But what I want you to do is concentrate on what's happening in The Hobbit right now. And Noldor and Elves are not mentioned in The, the Hobbit at all. But they could have, to answer the question that came up, they could have had um, interactions with the Sylvan Elves. But I did pull this out of the end of the last chapter, and I'm just going to read it to you, and I do have one thing highlighted that I wanted to point out. The feasting folk were wood elves, of course. They are not wicked folk. They have a fault. If they have a fault, it's a distrust of strangers. Though their magic was strong, even in those days, they were wary. Wary means that they're kind of cautious. They differed from the high elves of the West and were more dangerous and less, less wise. For most of them, together with their scattered relations in the hills and mountains, were descended from the ancient tribes that never went to fairy in the West. And then Tolkien goes on to drop in this, and this is about the most information he gives us about that fact that there are other types of elves. There, the light elves and the deep elves and the sea elves went and lived for ages and grew fairer and wiser and more learned and invented their magic and their cunning craft in the making of beautiful and marvelous things before some came back to the wide world. So the light elves, the deep elves, and the sea elves, that's the only names we know them by, they did go to fairy in the West. Some came back. In the wide world, meaning Middle Earth, the wood elves lingered in the twilight of our sun and moon and loved best the stars. And they wandered in the great forest that grew tall in the lands that are now lost. They dwelt most often by the edges of the woods from which they could escape at times to hunt, to ride, and to run over the open lands by moonlight or starlight. And after the coming of men, they took ever more and more to the gloaming of the dusk. Still, elves they were and remain, and that is good people. So we don't really get the word Noldor at all. So um, this is the only information that we need to focus on now is that the wood elves were not light elves, they were not deep elves, and they were not sea elves. There was also a question about whether or not the um, elves could be evil. Um, overall, Tolkien says that they are good people, but they are not wicked folk. Does that mean that one person or a group of people could do wicked things? Yes, they could. Just like anything, there could be evil things going on. But overall, they were good people. I see that we have some questions coming in here about the different types of elves. Okay, I'm not able to scroll up. So I see a question here from Declan that says, what are the deep elves? Well, Declan, we're going to just skip right over those things and um, I'm going to let you explore that on your own because right now we're gonna focus on the wood elves. Those are the people that we're writing about. And Jubilee, the same, um, the same kind of thing for you, my dear, um, is that we need to focus on the wood elves. Now, CJ has a question about what kind of magic they had. Well, I think we kind of saw a bit of magic 
um, yesterday, whenever they would be feasting, all the lights would go on and they would be, and then the dwarves came in or sent Bilbo in and poof, and instantly it was black. That sounds pretty magical to me. So I think that that's probably the major type of magic that they have. Okay, I'm getting a weird little clicking no no noise here, Corey, and I can't um, get the program to move at all. The um, the go to meeting program. Huh. Um, yeah. I'm not sure. I can't, get the, I can't get the site to close, and I can't get the things to scroll at all. I try. <clears throat> Bring your control panel back out, close down the chat window, and then pop it back out again. Um, it won't let me close anything. <laughs> really? No. Hmm. And it won't let me scroll or move anything either. Dear. Let's see. Okay. We, might, um, we might have to tell you what. Why don't you... Uh, go out and start it back up again is probably the best thing. And that means that I will take the opportunity to talk a little bit while you do that. All right, thank you so much. And this is a good transitional point for that anyhow. So, okay. Um, so I think one of the things that we can see as we get to this uh, point, to their capture by the elves. Um, so yeah, you can go ahead and uh, uh, just close down, uh, DMA, the top of your control panel um, and I then just Make sure you say leave uh, instead of end the session. You should have a I, leave. I can't get it. I can't get anything to. I'm going to try plugging in a mouse and see if that's a problem. Maybe. No. Right. There, there. It's. I can't get any of the buttons to light up or anything. Oh dear. Oh dear. Um, and I can't leave. I may have to. I may have to shut down the computer. Yeah. You. You. You just want to. You'll just want to kill it basically yeah i'm going to, i am going to have to restart i'm sorry class but no i'm going to let professor olson talk to you about those elves there were a lot of questions here about yeah. these elves the light elves the deep elves and the sea elves absolutely um and that's uh this is a this uh, you know passage that you that we've just been talking about is a really neat passage uh because it's um this is one of the places where Tolkien is really drawing on all of the work that he had done earlier on um, in his life. He had been writing stories about elves um, already for, for decades. Uh, the Hobbit is published in 1937. Uh, and he is, uh, um, he is actually, hang on a second. Dime, I can help you here. Uh, here we go. And I can, yes, there we go. Um, hmm, we still have her uh, frozen in time, unfortunately, over there. Let's see if we can, we can get her back. Um, okay, so uh, Tolkien had been working for years. The Hobbit is published in 1937, um, uh, but he was writing it in the early 1930s, so like 1930 to, there we go, 1930 to like 1933, basically, is when he was mostly writing The Hobbit. But he had already been writing elf stories uh, for 20 years before that. Um, and so when he starts talking about uh, the 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 light elves and the deep elves and the sea elves, um, it was he was here alluding to these other stories that he had written, stories which will eventually, in revised form, get published in the Silmarillion uh, much later on. Um, so yes, Joshua, the the deep elves are the Noldor. Uh, if you know any of the Silmarillion stories, you'll find that that's what they are. Now, but I agree with Miss Binkley that we should keep. Uh, our focus on the Hobbit here, and I don't want to get, it's really tempting for me because I love all of this stuff uh, and all of these other writings of Tolkien's to to get into the stories of all those things. Um, but I'm going to resist doing that uh, because I want to focus on the development of the Hobbit story and and basically sort of what this moment means. Because uh, I think this is a really, really neat moment. You think about the, you know, step back for a minute and think about the whole shape of the story to this point, right? Remember Bilbo in chapter one, poor, you know, little Bilbo sitting in the hall of his, um, 
uh, of his house while adventure breaks into his home, right? And, you know, he's he's thinking, you know, adventures are those nasty, uncomfortable things that make you late for dinner, and he doesn't want anything to do with adventures. This The, the tookishness wakes up inside him, and he embraces adventures and goes off uh, and begins his adventures. Hey, excellent. Hi, Welcome I'm back. back. We're um, talking about adventures. Yay, adventures. We're talking about adventures. Yeah, exactly. And um, so anyway, just kind of thinking about uh, thinking about where the adventure goes, right? The adventure, you know, crossing over from the safe and comfortable lands into the wild is one of the big things, right? And we see that as he gets to the last homely house and then beyond uh, into the mountains and is captured by the goblins and almost eaten by wolves and even Bjorn's house, which is kind of safe. Notice the difference between Bjorn's house and Elrond's house, right? Elrond's house is a homely house. Bjorn's house is nice, but it's not homely. It's weird, right? Uh, and so it's still wild. Uh, and Mirkwood is like the wild wildest thing of all. But notice when we get to Mirkwood, it's, it, the, the story begins to change a little bit, right? It's not just getting wilder and wilder and wilder. Now there's this new element, which is magic and elf magic, right? This fairy magic that begins to happen. So the encounter with the elves is really interesting. And Bilbo's time in the elves kingdom Right is a really interesting moment for him too because he's now he's living in Elfland, right? He's living inside uh, the 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 secret kingdom of the elves, um, and that puts him in a really funny position. Again, remember Bilbo, right? Uh, who like it was so weird the idea of him being a burglar uh, that um, none of the dwarves would even believe it, right? When Gandalf said that he was their burglar, and now not only is he a burglar, he is a a burglar living off his burglary in the kingdom of the elves whose magic enables them to like vanish and disappear and everything. And he is like more invisible and sneaky than the elves whose magic makes them invisible and sneaky, right? So this is uh, sort of an amazing development uh, for, for Bilbo's character. So um, that brings us, Miss Binkley, back to chapter nine and getting ready to uh, begin for today. Let me, uh, let me let you give, get your screen back here. Okay, so you can go ahead and share your screen again, and I think we should be good now. Well, there we go. Um, the computer admitted it did have a problem. It said, no problem. That's always the first step, is admitting you have a problem. So that's, that's right. what... Um, the, I can't close the control panel, however. With, um, it doesn't... The little yellow tab went away. Oh, it, it won't minimize? It will not minimize. You just kind of push it off the edge of the screen as much yeah, as you can. We, we, we can't see it, so it's fine. Okay, it, well, it's, it's, it's out of our way. So, campers, I'm hoping you can see me again, and we're ready to start Barrels Out of Bonds, which is yes. one of the very exciting chapters. Thank you, Professor Olson, for talking about elves. Sorry I missed that, because I always like talking about elves. So, we... Um, Professor Olson was just reviewing about how we went from Hobbiton over here on this side of our map, and we'd moved all the way through and gone over into the wild. And they've had a number of adventures. And where we are right now is right here in this area. So what happens now, um, you know that Thorin has been captured and he's in prison. He's not, they're not treating him poorly but they're not treating him like he's a king either. So let's see what happens with the rest of the party. Suddenly, out sprang the light of many torches all around them, like hundreds of red stars. Out leaped wood elves with their bows and spears and called the dwarves to halt. There was no thought of a fight. They had just escaped the spiders and they were trying to figure out which way they wanted to go to get back to the path. And they kind of took a vote on it and said, okay, let's go this way. And boom, there are the elves. So they, meaning the dwarves, simply stopped dead and sat down and waited, all except Bilbo, who popped on his ring and slipped quickly to one side. So here we have a beautiful uh, pen and ink sketch, and you can see the lights, how things are lit up now. And here, of course, we have the, the elves with their bows and then the dwarves just sitting there saying, we're done. Remember, they're starving. They've been poisoned. They're exhausted. They're lost. 
And, you know, Bilbo's not in much better shape, but he did put on his invisibility ring. So here is Tolkien's sketch of the Elven King's halls. Now, we had a little glimpse of those yesterday because we had a couple of images of Thorin before the Elven King in, and right by, at his throne. But here's what the outside looked like. There's a river and a bridge going across it and then a big heavy gate for protection. Here's another picture uh, with kind of a different venue, uh, a view uh, from Tolkien's mind movie. And if you take a look here, you'll see it's a long lane that leads right across this bridge and right up to the doors. And here we have another one that shows them being escorted over a bridge. And then to continue the story, that is why when the elves bound the dwarves in a long line, one behind the other and counted them, they never found the hobbit. Bilbo's just padding along right behind them. How long had Thorin been captured? Good question, Jubilee. Actually, he'd only been there for a couple of days because he was captured that night whenever he went in the third time and he fell asleep and he got captured that um, I believe the next day. And then they thought that then all of the rest of the dwarves were captured by spiders. And then so the next day, they were captured by, that's whenever the, 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 the entire dwarf army came out and got, excuse me, the elf army came out and captured the dwarves and brought them back. So I don't imagine it's more than one or two days. Jubilee says that she knows this has nothing to do with the elves, but she's curious. Were the goblins always at war? I don't think they were always at war, but they were always prepared for war because they were always making um, evil machinery and weapons and things. That's what they did. So they were, if, you know, if somebody called them to war, they could go quickly. So I think they were prepared for war. But I don't think whenever Bilbo and the dwarves stumbled in on the front door and were captured, I don't think that they were at war at that particular time. We have another question here about why did the wood elves live in the woods if they could not see the light of the stars through the thick trees? And why would they live in caves on that point? If they like stars, it seems like they would prefer the plains with some sort of enchantment to keep the elves' land safe. And that's from Lee. Lee, these are wonderful observations. And these are kind of the same things that I thought when I was a kid, I was thinking like, why would they want to live in a cave? I thought dwarves lived in the caves. Well, you have to remember you need to be secure, you need a safe place to live, and they can protect themselves because there's a lot of unhappy things happening around in Mirkwood, like the spiders, and then of course there are goblins not too far away, and of course wargs and so on and so forth, so you'd need a safe place. So what they would do would be go out like on those times whenever um, the company and Bilbo were going and trying to get and they, the lights would come out in the forest and they go and try to get some food from them. They also were just out celebrating and having a good time. So they would just go out like on their lawn at night and hang out and then whenever it was safe, uh, whenever it was time to go to bed, they just go home someplace safe to be secure. And there's another one here from Juliana. Did the elves and the hobbits have wars against each other? Not to my knowledge, Juliana. I don't think that I've ever read about the hobbits ever battling against anyone except um, goblins. And that doesn't happen until we read the Fellowship of the Ring. Trying to think. Nope. They don't, they pretty much just kind of hang out. And if trouble comes their way, they just kind of quickly vanish. So let's see now what happens at their end here. All right, so they are captured inside here. There's no place, there's no way for them to get out. There is just no, um, you know, they're in dungeons. Excuse me for just a moment. There we go. They're trapped in, and locked in, but Bilbo is wandering around and he is wearing his invisibility ring. And so this is going on and on and on. He has to steal food in order to just stay alive because the, the elves, you know, they are good people. They're keeping the dwarves alive. They're giving them food. They're not letting them loose and they're not treating them like they're princes, but they're being kind to them. 
And then one night he hears them talking about they're going to take these barrels. And this was a question that came up a couple of days ago. What did the elves eat and where did they get their food? Well, they had it shipped in. And they had shipped in in barrels. And the barrels now are ready to be sent back. And the way they send them back is they drop them into the river and they float down to the town. And then the people in the town fill them all back up again and ship them back to the Elven Kingdom. So um, that's the way their commerce is going. So he, Bilbo, um, hears this. And then what he discovers is that the butler and the keeper of the keys to the dungeon are sitting there drinking this really potent wine and they're just drinking in a great big glasses just like as if it's just regular table wine and it turns out it's a very powerful wine that's only meant to be had in little sips maybe and and, and so it puts them both to sleep so bilbo knows these barrels are going and he sees the chance to steal the keys so he takes the keys from the uh, from the 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 dungeon keeper for lack of a better word he takes his keys he unlocks all the dwarves he gets all the dwarves back there and if you look in this picture you can see them kind of sneaking by while everybody's sleeping here so he packs them in pack 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 and then he puts them there and he leaves them there and he's also quite nice bilbo's a nice burglar he takes the keys back and put them puts them on the the guys back on his his keychain so that Nobody really knows how the dwarves escape. It's almost like, did they have magic or something? And so they roll all the bell barrels out into the river. And the river is protected as well with this thing called a water gate. And what the water gate does is it drops all the way down and it prevents anything from coming in or out through the river. And so we'll start our story here. He, Bilbo, heard the creak of the water gate being hauled up, and he found that he was in the midst of bo a bobbing and bumping mass of casks and tubs all pressing together to pass under the arch and get out into the open stream. not needing to sleep the same way humans sleep. But I can't be more specific than that. Were there any other prisoners besides the dwarves, Jubilee would like to know? Um, I don't think there, there were any other prisoners in there. I don't remember any being mentioned. And that's how we would know is if it was mentioned like, oh, they were in a, in a, um, um, in a cell next to um, a goblin or something, but no. Um, who was the elves worst enemies? Well, right now, I think that the elves really dislike the spiders most of all because they it says in the book that they showed them no mercy, but I do not think that they are friends with goblins at all. And I'm pretty sure they're not going to be friends with wargs. So those were probably the enemies that they had, but um, the one that they mentioned that they showed no mercy to were the spiders. Allison would like to know what was the original conflict between the elves and the dwarves. I think we're going to hold on to that question, Allison. I'm going to make myself a quick note and talk about that later. Okay. I am muted. Okay. All right. Thanks. Um, thanks, Mythgard, for letting me know. Um, I think that we just have a cranky computer tonight, and um, we are just really happy that we have internet and can do this from Rome because I'm really enjoying spending time with everybody from all over Canada and the United States. This is so exciting and so much fun. So I'm glad you're here, and we're just going to have to continue on, and technology is technology. We'll just deal with it as it comes. Do the spiders go into battle with the elves? Amy would like to know that. I do believe that they mention it in there that they do battle with them. It's not going to be like in the movies. So if you're thinking about the movies and those dramatic battles, no. The only thing that's really talked about is Bilbo 
uh, battling with his sword and keeping the spiders back while the dwarves are escaping. But the dwarves uh, had out their little knives and they were also throwing rocks at the spiders. Apparently rocks and spiders don't get along real well. You can knock them out. Amy, is this Amel? If I'm not saying your, your name correctly, I'm so sorry. A-M-E-L, Amel. Um, why were some of the barrels empty? Well, actually, all of the barrels should have been empty. Some of them have dwarves in them, but they should all be empty because they're sending them back to the town to be loaded up with goods again to be brought back to the Alvin King's halls. So that's why they, they should all be empty. Let's take a look at our next slide here. I have a couple more slides just so that you can kind of get the feel of things kind of sliding down. Okay, out they went under the overhanging branches of the trees on either bank. Bilbo wondered what the dwarves were feeling and whether a lot of water was getting into their tubs. Because remember, these aren't solid. And here you can see Bilbo hanging onto the top. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Okay, so we're going to show another two pictures. These are two illustrations that Tolkien did, and they're two of my favorites. I just really like the style of these. Bilbo, you can see him here. He's riding on the top of a barrel. Why is he on the top of a barrel? Think about that. He, Bilbo, could see the paler sky between them, meaning the trees. The dark river opened suddenly wide, and there it was joined to a main water of the forest river flowing down in haste from the king's great door. So now they are actually out of the elf kingdom. They have escaped. Let's take a look at our journal entries. Sketch the Elven King's dungeons. Last time I asked you to sketch his hall, but this time the dungeon. So let your imaginations really help you decide and the description from reading the description in the book, decide how are you going to make these dungeons look. Their question is, how did Bilbo avoid being captured by the Wood Elves? Well, we talked about that a little bit, but do read that section and come up with a really good answer. The next one is to sketch Bilbo packing the dwarves into the barrels. This just makes me smile. I can't imagine I'd be real happy to climb into a barrel, but if it was my only way of escaping, maybe I would do that. But it can't have been comfortable. And then answer this question. How did Bilbo escape the Alvin King's dungeons? Dun, dun, dun. How did Bilbo avoid being captured by the Wood Elves? Well, on page 154, it says, so they, the company, simply stopped dead and sat down and waited, all except Bilbo, who popped on his ring and slipped quickly to one side. That is why, when the elves bound the dwarves in a long line, one behind the other, and counted them, they never found or counted the Hobbit. We talked about that with one of our slides, but this is your reference to answer that question. How did Bilbo escape the Elven King's dungeons? Well, we had a hint because we saw him off the top of the barrels. Now the very last barrel was being rolled to the doors. Remember, Bilbo's still wearing his in his invisibility ring, so nobody knows he's there. In despair and not knowing what else to do, poor little Bilbo caught a hold of it and was pushed over the edge with it. Down into the water he fell, splash into the cold, dark water with the barrel on top of him. He doesn't even get to ride inside the barrel. He has to actually hang on to the barrels and climb up on one if he can. Let's take a look at our questions. Um, Let's see. Oh, Will F., this is a very good question. Had the elves known about Gollum? Well, we find out in the Fellowship of the Ring that, um, yes, they did. But in this book, I don't recall them mentioning Gollum at all. Because Gollum kind of passes out of our story at the end of Chapter 5, whenever he yells, Baggins, we hates it, we hates it forever after Bilbo escapes, he doesn't really come out. So I'm not sure if they're aware of him at all, but they are in the Fellowship of the Ring. 
What was the season when this occurred? Well, Jubilee, remember they left in the spring and now it is early fall or late summer because the king has, the king of the oven king has a crown of fall leaves on his head. And that's how long it's taken them to get from Hobbiton in the spring. Remember at midsummer, they were at Rivendell and now it's early fall or late summer. Are the elves going to look for them, said Amy. Well, first of all, they have to discover that they're gone. And they just vanish overnight, okay? So we'll find out about that in a little bit. The clan would like to know, what would it look like if you were go, to go underwater while you were invisible? Well, physics says that the displacement of your body might, you would move water. But if you're in a moving river, nobody may notice. Interesting question. Good thinking. Maybe that's how you can, maybe you can draw Bilbo invisible underwater. It'd be fun. Let's take a look at our next chapter. A warm welcome. They didn't get a warm welcome from the Elven King, but this chapter is about to change the welcome. So they left Hobbiton, came across here, came up this thing here. Here's the Elven King's halls, and they escape out here. Now they're at Long Lake. Lake Town or Eskroth is right here. So this is where they are now. Let's see what happens next. So. The barrels all arrive down by the city, and or Lake Town, I guess I should call it. I like this one because it kind of shows the Lonely Mountain in the background. As soon as the raft, so the barrels come down, and they gather them up and tie them up together in a raft, and that's how they push them down to the city. As soon as the raft of barrels came in sight, boats rowed out from piles of the town, then ropes were cast and oars were pulled, and soon the raft was drawn out of the current of the Forest River. And then here we have little Bilbo taking out a very unhappy looking dwarf. First of all, a barrel was cut loose by Bilbo and pushed to the shore and opened. Groans came from inside and out crept a most unhappy dwarf. He does not look happy. Jubilee has a very interesting question. And about the Elven King having any other name besides the Elven King. In The Hobbit, he does not. He is known as the Elven King. So that's what we call him. Here we have a colorized version of one of Tolkien's um, own sketches of what Lake Town looks like. And you can see, here's the barrels, here's a raft of barrels, boats so on and so forth. And here's the town built entirely on pilings out in the river with this bridge going out to it. Yeah, there are some huts and things and some supplies and all on the shore, um, but the town itself was built out on the lake. And this one here is another one that's really interesting. This artist has a really interesting mind movie. This looked almost like a totem pole to me when I first saw it. Because, like I said, I am from Alaska, and totem poles, especially in southeast Alaska, where I used to live, they're really common. Like, they're on, you know, if you walk around the city, and there's totem poles. So, kind of like street lamps. They're just everywhere. And with this bird, um, on the top, I said, oh, it's a totem pole. How exotic is that? And then I noticed that it's probably a bird, a diving bird, just dry, drying its wings. So, he also has it built out here on pilings. And he also includes, this artist includes the Lonely Mountain off in the distance. So let's read this description here. Not far from the mouth of the Forest River was a strange town he heard, he, meaning Bilbo, heard the owl speak of in the King's Cellars. It was not built on the shore, though there were a few huts and buildings there, but right out on the surface of the lake. How many days journey from Lake Town to the Dwarves Mountain, Jubilee asks. Well, we're going to be talking about that here at the end of this chapter and starting on Monday, we'll talk about how long it takes them. So be waiting for that one. Here are, oops, here are a couple of more images that I put in 
just so you can see other people's interpretations. I almost did not put these in because they both look kind of gloomy. But you can see, here's the lonely mountain off in the distance. And here's the pilings. Here's the pilings out away from the shore. So this part, the, these are two different authors, our artists, and their mind movies make the town look really, really big and elaborate and fancy, a lot fancier than my mind movie made. Okay, so they are there. They're welcomed in the town. And Thorin just basically, when he gets all the dwarves together, they, he just marches into the town and says, I am Thorin. I am king under the mountain. I have returned, and I'm claiming my town again. And there have been myths and legends about this for a really long time in, um, in like, town. And so everybody thought, wow, he's back. We're all going to get rich again. Every, nobody's thinking about the dragon, mind you. But everybody assumes we're going to get rich. So one day, whoops, I missed one. Oh, no, that's one of our questions. Sorry. Sometimes I move things around because I think it'll make it more interesting, and then I get confused. So anyway, they're well welcomed into the town, and the town agrees to provide them with boats and supplies and uh, ponies to which go up on the shore around the shoreline to meet them at the Lonely Mountain. And so off they go on that adventure. Here we have another picture of Lake Town. So let's read our description. So one day through the autumn was now getting far on and the winds were cold and leaves were falling fast. Three large boats left Lake Town laden with rowers, dwarves, Mr. Baggins, and many provisions. The master and his counselors bade them farewell from the great steps of the town hall. The white oars dipped and splashed and off they went north up the lake on the last stage of their long journey. Let's take a look here at our questions. Why was Lake Town built on the lake, Alan wants to know. Well, Alan, I think that someplace in the book it mentions to us that it's built down on the lake as protection from the dragon. Because apparently the dragon doesn't like being out over water. I thought, personally, I thought the dragon would just fly over there and not have any problem. But what, one of the things they do is they try to break the bridges to prevent the dragon from getting them. So it's there for protection. And Joshua would like to know, did all the dwarves come into Lake Town? Why, yes, they did, Joshua. Thorin was the first one to go in uh, because he is, of course, the most important dwarf. But all of the dwarves entered Lake Town. Jubilee would like to know if Thorne's sister had a name beside the sons of my father's daughter. She is the only named dwarf, but she's not named in The Hobbit. You will find her name in the appendices of The Lord of the Rings, and her name is Dis, D-I-S, and I believe there's an accent over the I. And she is the mother of Feely and Keely. CJ says, do you have to take a boat to the mountain or do they have a trail? Actually, they did both. You can carry more cargo in a boat. And so they loaded up the boats to go to the Molly Mountain with tons of provisions. But they also brought horses around and ponies around by land up the edge of the lake. And they were also laden with provisions. And it's nice having a, a pony because in that way you can go out over land and travel around more quickly. Whereas with a boat, you're really combined to either the lakes or the river. So that's convenient to have both. Let's take a look at our journal entries. Sketch Lake Town. Now we have to look at some ideas from various authors. Make your mind movie. Read your descriptions and do a nice sketch. Then answer what happened to the dwarves in Lake Town. Your next sketch is the feast that they had in Lake Town. The dwarves were invited to a mighty feast. So sketch that. And then answer this. How did the dwarves leave Lake Town? 
Let's look at our first question. What happened to the dwarves in Lake Town? They were all doctored and fed and housed and pampered in the most delightful and satisfactory fashion. Really different from the way the Alvin King treated them. A large house was given up to Thorin and his company. Boats and rowers were put at their service and crowds sat outside and sang songs all day because they were so happy to have the king under the mountain return. And how did the dwarves leave Lake Town? Three large boats left Lake Town, laden with rowers, dwarves, Mr. Baggins, and many provisions. So we're at the end of our slideshow and lecture, and I'm checking to see if there are more questions. How old would Lake Town be exactly, says Will F. Well, there were several towns in that area. There was, of course, Erebor, the Lonely Mountain, and they had a city underneath, a city within the mountain there. Right outside was a town called Dale, and then further down towards the, then down the running river, it goes into the Long Lake, and that's where Eskaroth, or Lake Town, was. So there were several towns in the area, and they actually predated um, Smog's invasion, which was well over 100 years ago. And so the towns, would have, they were well-established and prosperous towns. So they would have been several hundred years old at least. Well, um, Professor Olson, are you ready to talk to us some more about exciting things and answer some of those questions? I am. <clears throat> I am. And uh, <clears throat> so I'm happy to, <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> excuse me, pardon me. I'm happy to take more questions now uh, <clears throat> from kids who have, who have questions right now. But I would also like to talk about, um, <clears throat> sorry, having a hard time clearing my throat here. Um, would like to talk about an issue that got brought up a couple times in the first <clears throat> class or two. And that is, does the Hobbit take place on Earth in our world? <clears throat> and I want to talk about that a little bit more in the context of the overall fictional frame that Tolkien gives to the Hobbit. Because um, <clears throat> this is a very interesting part of the Hobbit story and the larger Hobbit story that Tolkien develops. The idea, of course, is that the Hobbit Tolkien didn't connect The Hobbit to any particular place or time in our world's history. Like he's not trying to pretend that this is a uh, that this is an exactly true story that happened at a particular time and place. But <clears throat> it also doesn't happen, you know. You know the beginning of Star Wars, right, where it says "long, long ago in a galaxy far, far away." <clears throat> it's not exactly like that either. It is supposed to be near us. You'll remember those references at the beginning uh, in chapter one of The Hobbit to the idea that we might still meet hobbits nowadays, except we don't, we, we're not likely to because they're so quick and at vanishing, right? Uh, <clears throat> they're so small and so, so sneaky. Uh, and we make such a lot of noise when we, when we, uh, when we walk around. Um, <clears throat> but still, there is the idea that this clearly does take place within our world. So it's a fictional story, but he pretends, basically, that it takes place within our world. And this is also part of <clears throat> what we see in the runes that you guys were talking about on the first day of class. That um, you remember how the runes on the title page uh, talk about how the story is only compiled? by J.R.R. Tolkien, right? He doesn't claim to write it. He claims to be translating it, <clears throat> that he found it and he put it together and he's translated it and published it, but he didn't make it up. And this also comes back to another question that you guys were asking a couple days ago, which is, does everybody in the story speak the same language, right? And <clears throat> there, most of the people speak, they can all talk to each other, except the wargs. The wargs speak a language that nobody else speaks. Right. Um, but <clears throat> the rest of them all are able to communicate with each other. Um, but again, the whole idea is, that, does that mean that they all speak English? No, no, they're not speaking English. Uh, Tolkien translated it, you see. Um, so again, the, the, it's part of the 
story of the story, right? Tolkien not only tells the story, but he makes up a story about how the story came together and how uh, and how the story got to us, right? Uh, and so that story is that this is that, you know, there was a book that was found and we'll see at the very end of The Hobbit, ultimately where that book came from, right? But uh, th that book was found and translated by Tolkien <clears throat> and brought together into a, into a compilation. And, and, the, and, and that's where we have, that's why the narrator of The Hobbit sometimes refers to modern things that seem out of place, right? Like you may remember in chapter one, when Bilbo is very afraid in his parlor, he makes a shriek. And the narrator says that the shriek sounded like an express train coming out of a tunnel, right? It burst out of him like an express train coming out of a tunnel. And it might sound weird, like you might be like, hey, wait a second, there aren't any express trains in Bilbo's world, right? No, but there are express trains in our world. And that's the modern narrator talking to us. Um, <clears throat> you may also remember that when the dwarves are up in the, uh, up in the, the pine trees, it says that they looked like Christmas trees. And again, you might think like, but wait a second, they don't have Christmas in Middle-earth. No, they don't have Christmas in Middle-earth. But again, he's not talking about that. He's talking to us, right? We know what Christmas trees look like. So <clears throat> there are several places where you can see the modern narrator of the story has, uh, uh, is, is talking directly to us, the modern readers. But generally, it's a story that he is taking from and developing from this older story that he found <clears throat> and is uh, and is translating. <clears throat> so yes, uh, uh, Declan says <clears throat> here that Middle Earth was in ancient Europe. Yes, basically, it's like prehist. It, it is generally in Europe. Uh, the northwestern part of the old world, meaning northwestern Europe. Um, so yes, it is generally in, uh, you know, that's generally the area, but he never identifies any places, right? So it's not like you can go and figure out, like, where is Mirkwood? Like, what what modern country is Mirkwood in? He never gives that kind of detail. Um, <clears throat> but he um, he does say that it takes place generally uh, in, in, in Europe. Um, <clears throat> so... The whole idea of the Hobbit, CJ, I was kind of talking about that a little bit earlier on. Um, I, the Hobbit started off as a story that Tolkien told to his kids. Um, he he would tell he told them this story every night at bedtime, and he wrote it down. And so, in that sense, it has nothing to do with the other stories that he was writing. But it it goes back and it uses a lot of the 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 ideas and the elements that he had thought of in the other stories that he wrote. Um, so Tolkien was, you know, he was, he was a dad. He was about 40 years old when he was writing The Hobbit. Um, so this was not written by a very young person. It was written by a dad who was telling these stories to his kids. Um, <clears throat> Hobbits themselves, and, you know, a lot of these ideas, Tolkien is dealing, is using a lot of traditional fairy tale ideas. He loved fairy tales and fairy stories. Um, and a lot of the things that you can see uh, in this book are either general ideas, which are in fairy stories, or some other books like Beowulf, the, the famous poem Beowulf. Uh, he uses a couple elements. The dragon, Smaug the dragon, is very much like, uh, you know, has, has some important things in common with uh, the dragon that's in Beowulf. Um, <clears throat> Hobbits themselves, though, are totally made up. Tolkien invented hobbits. There are no hobbits before Tolkien. Um, elves, you know, he's dealing with elf stories, dwarves. There are lots of dwarf stories, and he's bringing in those elements. Goblins, lots of goblin stories, uh, but hobbits he made up. <clears throat> okay, let's see. Um, Good. Good, I see. Oh, Will had one follow-up question, still thinking about Lake Town. Do you think Lake Town wanted gold for their good hospitality? Oh, yeah. I, I, think, <clears throat> I think that their good hospitality was not out of the kindness of their hearts. Uh, they thought they were going to get something out of it, and they were hoping that they were going to get lots of gold from the king under the mountain uh, when he finally became king. Yeah. That's one of the reasons why they were sitting outside and singing, because they were really happy they were going to get rich. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Um, good. Good. 
Um, let's see. So other things. <clears throat> I'm sorry. I apologize. And my voice seems to have suddenly vanished. Um, but, uh, oh, I wanted to talk a little bit about a couple of the questions you guys asked about Bilbo and the elves. Um, there was that, that very perceptive question about how does Bilbo know what elves smell like if he's never met, this is the first time he's been to Rivendell, right? And the answer is he clearly has met elves, which shows you, of course, <clears throat> not only that Bilbo has encountered elves before, but it also shows you that elves come to the Shire because we know, you know, they, they, they come to, to near where Bilbo lives because we know that Bilbo has never left before. He has never been on, and this is his first adventure. Right. So it shows to you that elves, although you have, you know, as I was talking about earlier today, <clears throat> the safe part of the world. Right. And then the wild and things getting increasingly dangerous. Um, <clears throat> elves go everywhere. Right. We have elves in the wildest part in the middle of Mirkwood. We have elves in the last homely house. And clearly elves sometimes visit the Shire. Um, near where Bilbo lives. And so he's seen them from a distance and he's encountered them. Um, and he likes them, but he's a little bit afraid of them. Uh, and he does recognize what they smell like. Uh, so uh, I think that um, it's... There are a couple references in some of Tolkien's other writings to the idea that elves smell really, really good. Uh, uh, there's one elf in particular who is described as smelling really, really good, smelling like uh, like flowers and uh, and you know summer days and all of these wonderful, beautiful things. Um, and I, I always kind of think that that's what Tolkien had in mind when he talked about uh, how elves smell. But I know, as Ms. Binkley has been saying, your own mind movie might be different. I loved Ms. Binkley's. Uh, uh, when she talked about what she always thought of, how it made her think of like the smell of baking bread and like, f you know, food cooking and, <clears throat> and hospitality smells. That seems perfect to me. Yeah. Any other questions that you guys have for me about, about the Hobbit or about, you know, about anything in the story or about, uh, about sort of the, 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 the story in general, uh, uh, sort of bigger picture. Happy to answer other questions before I lose the rest of my voice. Let's see, so CJ, do they, uh, do they, do they, uh, do they have Halloween? No, not exactly. That's not, I mean, they have, um, I wouldn't be surprised <clears throat> to see them celebrate something at that point. It's a traditional celebration. Um, but uh, no, they don't have, we don't see them have uh, holidays like that. The only holidays that we hear them talking about, they have a Yule celebration. So right around Christmas time, they have Yule celebration. And Midsummer is a big celebration. Um, apart from Midsummer and Yule, I'm trying to think of any specific references to other holidays of that kind. And I can't think of any off the top of my head. Um, Okay, good. Um, ah, Katie says, how does Bilbo have such big pockets to stick a sword in? I think he was sticking the sword inside his pants. I think it's a question not of how big his pockets are, but how baggy his pants are, is what I think that's a story about, frankly. Uh, because he has, it's, it's long enough to be a short sword to him. Um, so it's not a huge sword. Even to the Hobbit, it's a short sword. But it's got to be... The blade has to be, what, at least a foot long, right, in order for it to be a sword, uh, to be like a sword and not a dagger to Bilbo. So he has, he's only like three feet tall, and he has like a one-foot sword stuck down his pants, right? So I think we have to imagine, and he hides it well enough that the goblins don't find it, right? So I think it has to be over like next to his leg, down his pants, so that it's like right alongside his leg on the inside, uh, and, they, uh, and, and they never see it. But Katie, I agree. It took me a long time to figure out how to picture that, right? Uh, how how to how to picture Bilbo with the with the with with the sword hidden in his pants so that nobody could see it. And he even forgets about it, so it must have been comfortable. Yep. Exactly, <laughs> it must have been comfortable. Exactly, exactly. 
Yeah. And I, Keaton, thank you. I'm actually not sick. I just kind of choked on something and now my voice went away and I can't get it back. I have no idea what's going on there, but my apologies for sounding so hoarse here all of a sudden. Okay. Hey, uh, uh, Ms. Binkley, D uh, Will wants to know what, what time it is in Rome. It is a little after eight o'clock in the evening in Rome and it's very, very hot and the sun has just gone down. Yeah, you can see by the windows behind you that the sun is down now. So yeah, yeah. And I'm in I'm I'm in New Hampshire on the East Coast, uh, and it's two o'clock here in the afternoon. Which means, of course, that we have come to the end of our time. Well, you guys have been super patient today. Thank you guys. We had some technical difficulties which we had to get through, and then I lost my voice. So we've had uh, all kinds of issues here today. Uh, today, well, I hear that I even was muted for a while and. We lost your voice very briefly, but yeah, it's uh, it's all it's all. So uh, today was our day of adversity, uh, but we made it through, and you guys were great. Thanks again for your participation and questions. So next uh, Monday, <clears throat> right? So we'll see you guys back on Monday, uh, and on Monday we are in chapters eleven and twelve, right? That's correct. So we will actually get to meet the dragon on Monday, which will be yeah, great. Yeah. I was going to say the adventure heightens. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, the, 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 the next big stage of the adventure. Um, so good. if you guys have gotten behind on your reading, you've got the weekend to try to catch up. So do try to make sure that you've read through the end of chapter 12 uh, for Monday. So thanks, everybody. And we will see you then. Have a good weekend. Bye-bye. Bye.